Okay, so it's three past eight. Let, let's get us started. So, hi, Relo from Mexico City. Well, uh, before we start, I would like to thank you all for being here, for taking uh, the time to learn something, to do something different. Um, I know that this time many people want to, to use it for something different, like to wind up or relax. Um, I really appreciate that you are here learning something. So I really hope that you find it useful, that you find it interesting, and that the resources that we share with you um, will help you with your practices, okay? Um, I would like to first start by thanking all the institutions that have helped us to make this happen, uh, like Enseña por México, which is a, an organization that helps to reduce the educational gap or education in inequity that we have in, in Mexico, but also internationally. Uh, I would also like to help uh, the Cámara Nacional de la Mujer in Michoacán because they are also supporting us and we're actually working to provide, um, yeah, training to teachers uh, in the state who want to, who don't have access to this uh, that easily. Uh, I would also like to, have to say thank you to Unite for Literacy. This is a completely free online uh, library for, uh, that is focusing on emergent readers. And you can actually use it for your class as well. We, we will actually talk about this uh, website later uh, today. English for Life. English for Life is um, an institution, uh, a teacher training institution in the States. And it is managed by Kim Carroll. She's one of our speakers. And she was recommended to us by the American consulate because she's the English language fellow uh, uh, in, in Paraguay of the American embassy. So thank you to the American Embassy as well for, for directing me to her because um, she's been a sweetheart. She's been helping me with this. Smart Train in Mexico, thank you as well because um, we wouldn't be able to do all of this without your support. They have been helping us with all the advertising and everything. Uh, it is a teacher training, and yeah, a teacher training uh, company in Mexico. And also to Codice, which is an organization, a non-governmental organization that uh, provide support to LGBTQ uh, plus people. Okay, and well, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Brandon Loy, Director of Teacher Panda. I have been a teacher trainer for over the past four years. And um, well, I have a Cambridge Delta, a Cambridge Delta, uh, a specialism in business English teaching and another one in advanced methodology. Uh, I studied a degree in English language teaching. It is my passion. And uh, well, uh, I have worked for several institutions like the American Consulate. I was a teacher in their uh, English Access Micro Scholarship Program, uh, International House, and I am currently working as the National Academic Coordinator of CERTECA, which is a Cambridge um, Authorized Center, MXOA6. Uh, I would also like to introduce you to the other speaker that we will have today. He's one of my closest friends. Um, he's also a teacher trainer. He has collaborated with the British Council and several other institutions. And what can I say about him? Uh, every time that I take him to, to a course with me to other states, uh, people just love him. Um, I remember this time where they actually uh, threw up a party, all the students threw up a party just for him because of how much they actually cared about him. And he's also studying a master's degree in, in technology, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, well, let's, let's hear a little bit about him from him. So what else can you tell us about you, Abraham? Introduce yourself to, to our audience. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Yes, <laughs> we've been friends for, for a while. Well, um, I studied my BA in teaching English as a foreign language in the University of Guadalajara. So I see some of my best friends from the career. And also I'm currently studying my, my master's as uh, Brandon says in learning technologies here in, uh, in the campus in Ciudad Guzman. And I'm working on the use of uh, mobile devices at the, in, in the classrooms, obviously. Okay. Thank you, Abraham, from that, for, uh, for that introduction. So yesterday with Anna's talk, um, she actually told us that uh, the most important thing is for you teachers to actually be uh, emotionally healthy in order for you to provide 
a good service to your students. So now today we're actually going to talk about something more, uh, more practical. Now we're going to talk about the, the integrated part of how can I use technology in the classroom? What can I do? Is it good? Is it bad? And well, uh, let, let's, let's start with this. So I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can actually see my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> mm -hmm. And let's just begin with the topic, okay? Okay, so today we're going to cover a series of uh, topics. For example, we need to think, uh, should I use or not technology in my classroom? We're also going to discuss some free resources that uh, are available to you. And we're also going to talk about how you can use them in class, really briefly, because we have many. Uh, we're also going to talk about the different challenges uh, that the digital teacher can actually face. And also the application of, of technology and how we can evaluate or assess um, the different resources that are available to us. Okay, so before we actually start talking about technology, we need to think, how do we learn outside the classroom? Okay, think about this in a second. And in here, we have uh, the following ideas. For example, we discover, uh, we discover and learn through interaction and collaboration. We learn through experimentation and creativity, through play, for example. Uh, that's why so many methodologies that include gamification are so relevant nowadays, especially for, for young students, right? Um, we also learn through out of curiosity or engagement. Uh, when we are curious about something, we just experiment with it and we just try to figure out or, or we don't know about something and we're curious. So we search for uh, more information. We, we try to look for resources in order to learn about it. So we get engaged when we are curious about something. We also negotiate on previous knowledge. So maybe I have this idea, but it's incomplete. So I talk to another person and this person says like, oh, I have this extra information that is more updated or that is different or contrasting to what you thought. And through that negotiation, we reach um, an agreement and we build on that knowledge. We also learn through imitation. We copy others, uh, other people, what they say, how they say, what they do, their activity through repetition or memorization as well. Through associations, for example, we also learn uh, we associate uh, a word that sounds similar to another one and that's how we learn it. Or we associate, for example, a word to a particular event. So that's how we um, kind of like remember them in a better way. Or we associate a word to a movement like in TPR. We also learn through reflection of analysis. Uh, when we are um, cognitively involved in something and we analyze it, we study it, 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 it helps us to, to, uh, to make it more memorable and relevant. Okay. Um, hi to everyone. We have some people from Gomez Palacio and Lima, Peru. We have someone from Uruapan. Hi, Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, and we also learn through failure. For some, mm -hmm. failure is a bad thing, but we actually learn by making mistakes, uh, by getting the wrong answers. And that's all right. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think um, that's the best thing that, or the best thing that can happen to us to make a mistake and learn from it. Uh, it would be bad if we didn't learn from that experience, but uh, most learners get to actually improve and develop through failure as well, as long as we provide them with the appropriate feedback. And now that we have all this repertoire of um, things or, or, or ways in which we can learn, for example, we can learn from prob uh, through problem solving. I don't know. Um, I don't know what's the paradigm that you follow, whether you are a con constructivist, a uh, behaviorist, a uh, cognitivist. I don't know what, um, what, uh, what you follow. But these are the different ways in which we learn. And I want you to reflect on the following questions that I have for you. The first one, how is my classroom similar to this that I am presenting to you? 
share with me, tell me in the comments, how is my classroom similar to this? How is my, my classroom uh, allowing for interaction and collaboration, for example? How is my classroom allowing uh, students to fail in a safe uh, way or in a safe environment? How is my classroom uh, fostering reflection and analysis or games or problem solving, repetition? And I also want you to tell me, how is my classroom failing to replicate this? Okay, tell me in the comments. Okay. Uh, Sammy Aguilar mentions that mistakes teaches a lot. We learn by observation. I agree. You, you have a really good point in here, Letty. Um, in your classroom, you try uh, using problem solving skills. Okay, good, Anna. Is there mm -hmm. anything that is similar to your classroom or different? Tell me in the comments, please. Uh, also, Sammy says. Uh, Hi, Katie. Good I to have you here. Mistakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes we play with the students, we, we have competitions, we foster motivations, Anna, uh, motivation. Good, Anna, thank you. We also foster creativity, that's good. So the idea of what we aim to do in our classroom is to have these, and also the things that they mentioned in the comments. We try to have these or to imitate this. So it is important for us to reflect, what can I do to achieve it? And how can technology play a part on achieving this? Is it going to help me or is it going to be detrimental for my class? So it is good to reflect. Now, um, in here, should I use technology in my class? This is a good question that you have to ask yourself and that I also want you to, to share with me. Because what do you think is more important? Technology in class? or a clear rationale behind my teaching practices? What do you think that is more relevant? That I actually know why I do things, what I'm using technology, um, and that is actually going to help and support my learners, or just use it because it's trendy or because uh, my director and coordinator are asking me to use it, or because I know that students are just uh, in love with technology. What would, do you think that would be more important to actually know the theory behind it and how it can help or just using it? Tell me in the comments. You think that for sure uh, we should use it? Shiona says that both. Hi, Shiona. A clear rationale. Gamification is relevant in our daily lessons, but games uh, must have an objective, not just wait of time. Good. I completely agree with you, Hector. I think, um, as you mentioned, it can be both. But if there isn't a clear rationale in my practices, if I don't really have a purpose for using technology in my class, or if I don't really know if it's going to help or support my learners to do it in a better way, maybe I should reconsider why I'm using technology. And in here, I have this question that is also important to, to keep in mind or bear in mind. What is the point in repla replacing a teaching aid uh, when there is no change in the approach or method being used. Uh, for example, what is the point in changing a reading book for a tablet if I'm going to use it exactly in the same way, just making students read? It is not going to make it more fun or more engaging. I'm just replacing the teaching aid. So what is the point? Tell me in the comments. Uh, I teach with multiple intelligences, both depend uh, on the group. Um, you need a purpose for teaching. That's right. I agree. Um, someone's telling me that um, it is not reproducing. Tell me if you have any problems with the broadcast. Okay. Both are important. I agree. Both are important. Okay. And lastly, is technology adding value to my teaching practice? Before we actually start into introducing all these different gadgets and all these different websites and resources online, why not just asking myself, is technology actually adding value to what I'm doing in my class? Is it going to support my learners? Is it going to help them um, perform in a better way, be more engaged, have fun? And is it going to help me simulate 
what we discussed in the uh, in the previous um, uh, card. Is it going to help me make learners experiment, reflect, uh, fail in a safe environment? We should reflect on that before we actually just start jumping into technology. Okay, so why should we use technology, or or how is it going to help us in the classroom? Technology helps us to make learning uh, the learning process more flexible. Um, we have synchronous learning, and we also have asynchronous learning. So for those, for example, who cannot attend this webinar, they will have the opportunity to actually access it at their own time uh, later tonight, maybe. Um, it is also going to help them to distribute, for those who are taking online courses, um, it is going to help them distribute the workload. Instead of spending five hours straight in a classroom, uh, they can actually say like, okay, I'm, I can devote one hour in the morning and then three hours at night and then maybe work on the other things in my free time or the empty spaces or empty slots that I have in my schedule. Um, so it makes it more flexible. And by flexibility, we're also talking about how learners can adapt to, or how we can adapt to the learners as well, uh, to different technologies, to different uh, apps, websites, and hence to their different learning, um, to their different learning processes. Okay, so Abraham is telling me that he had a problem with his internet connection. Uh, that explains why he has been so silent. <laughs> Let's just wait for him to connect, okay? Um, let me check. Um, okay, so Michelle Gallego says that the use of technology supports learning and also, uh, as she works with teenagers, it helps her to get her attention uh, to be trendy. It also helps us to, to do that, I agree. It is also uh, interesting for the students, I agree as well. Technology makes teaching faster and we can give more details and information to the students. I think it depends on how technology is used. We're actually going to talk about that. Armando Alvarez says that it will facilitate an inquiry approach where research by themselves is needed in the classroom. Oh, okay, we actually call that also a flipped classroom. And we're actually going to talk about that at the end of the session as well. Uh, first, you need to enjoy the use of technology and understand the use of each tool. I agree, Frida. I think that's a, a very important point. If we are not interested in technology, if it's something that we just don't like, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But we also need to remember that um, at the end of the day, technology is here to stay, okay? And we have to adapt as teachers. And well, uh, those who don't start using technology, uh, unfortunately, we're going to start, uh, start getting behind. So yes, love for technology is something that is important, but that love can actually grow on us. Okay, so technology also, hel also helps us to maximize slice time. Uh, for example, uh, submission of work, uh, to post evidence, all that kind of thing can be maximized uh, using technology. Organization, uh, sharing materials, sharing distribution of, um, of content, or even curating our own um, library of resources for students to use. So it definitely maximizes class time. Okay, we have Abraham back. Um, now, as you mentioned, as you are actually uh, still saying in the in the chat uh, technology is going to help us to to boost student engagement it is going to help us to have them engage i think we need to think about when how and for what we use technology completely agree i completely agree those are very important questions that we need to consider when we use it because um if it's not really relevant or necessary then why bother right uh, make the content more memorable. We have to, to face it. Uh, the new generations are born plugged into a computer. They love it. They really like it. Uh, for example, I see my little sister. She's about uh, five years old. And uh, she is now having uh, online classes because of the current situation that we're not going to talk about because the idea is to forget about it for a second. And I see that she gets really engaged talking to the camera and to her classmates uh, on the website and seeing her teacher in there. And she's really motivated. 
and the new generations love it. So by doing that, when they are interested in something, when they are connected personally to something, it makes content more memorable. Uh, technology helps us to develop our students' critical thinking skills. You, many of you have actually mentioned research and, and, and making students look for the information before coming to class, and yes, that's important. And it is going to help us develop, develop their critical thinking skills. From the information that you have online, what piece of information is actually um, accurate? Which one is actually going to really help me? And which one is actually false or, or, or not relevant? Okay. Uh, foster learner autonomy. How can I help my students to be more independent? And we're actually going to talk about this uh, when we mentioned the flipped classrooms as well. Um, how, can I, I, how can I actually make my student um, look for material on his own or look for the information on his own? And one of the ones that I like the most to display work and showcase progress to raise awareness. Um, for example, a platform that I use a lot is Edmodo. We're going to talk about it later today as well. And something that I like uh, doing, and also on the Teacher Panda Facebook page, is to post their work and post what they do and share what they're doing, uh, just to showcase it, just to display it to the audience and for them to actually feel proud about what they're doing. And they like it a lot. And they can also see a progression on how they started and, and what they're doing uh, afterwards, all right? So in here, uh, Abraham is going to share some important aspects or relevant considerations that we have to bear in mind before we start using technology. Are you there? I cannot hear you, Abraham. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you talk? Yes. Can you? Okay, can you hear me now? I cannot hear you at all. I think your, your microphone is disconnected or something. Let me check. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, as Anna mentioned, um, something that I like about teachers is that we understand uh, and that we actually are very patient and, and, and kind. So I know that, <laughs> that uh, we have technical problems. That's one of the first things that we have to bear in mind when we introduce technology. There yeah. will be problems. All the time. Abraham, Say something to see if I can hear you now. Yes, can you hear me now? Nope, it seems as if, as if it were muted. Guys, can you actually can hear what he's saying? Oh, okay, so they can hear you. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, I have uh, some technical issues with my internet, you know, like many teachers now are working online, so we're like all working online. Okay, now let me um, talk about these relevant considerations. Okay, these relevant considerations, I took it um, once from my personal experience and the other ones I took it from uh, teachers who work online as well as I do it. And also uh, some from uh, authors, okay? So the first consideration that I, I, I put it was lesson plan. Okay, what, is, what about lesson plan? Okay, we all do lesson plan, but Remember, as we're working with technology, uh, uh, we have to protect protect ourselves, okay? So the idea is that if something happens, okay, you have to take that into consideration, okay? So that you're going to use uh, software and the authorities of your school and parents, especially if you're working with minors, so they know that you're going, you're going to work with technology. Also, as well as we, we face in a moment uh, possible problems and solutions, okay? You have to take that in mind also, right? Like what happened if I didn't have internet? What happened if my projector broke down, okay? What happened if the app uh, didn't work with all of my students? What happened if, uh, I don't know, like half of my classroom uh, brought a device? So you have to take that in mind, okay? Also, um, this one, I put it because it's really relevant for me. I mean, it says, be humble, however you take the last decision, okay? What does be humble, okay? Especially if you're working with uh, teens, okay? They're really, really uh, creative, okay? 
So you have to be kind of like humble and accept ideas from them, okay? Like sometimes your students say, hey teacher, why don't we do this one, okay? Or why don't we make uh, this project like that? So analyze it and if you think uh, your students can do it and they're happy to do it and it doesn't affect you, you can do it as well, right? However, I said, you have to take the last decision, okay? Because sometimes, I mean, if you're talking with uh, teenagers, sometimes uh, it happens that uh, the ideas could not be like uh, appropriate uh, for the class. So remember, you're the one in charge. So also if you are like, for example, the coordinator and you want to allow uh, the rest of the teachers uh, to participate or to bring ideas in order to improve uh, their teaching uh, um, performance, you have to be humble, okay? You don't have to know everything because I face that, right? I mean, in my experience, I have, uh, I have, uh, I have had some uh, coordinators who were like kind of like arrogant. So they didn't want to like accept that they, they were not so like, technological, so it's okay. I mean, you have to be humble, okay? You have to accept ideas. But however, as a coordinator or as a teacher, you have to take the last decision, okay? Uh, the, the next one is, I said, be creative, okay? When you're working with technology, you have to be super creative, okay? Like for example, if you're working with an app or if you're working with a platform or any resource that you have on internet, okay, you have to be very creative, I mean, uh, I have seen these ones are on several webinars that I have uh, uh, I have gave and I have this this um, uh, question from several teachers. How can I do this one? How can I implement uh, this app when I don't have internet? What happen if I don't have computers? What happen if I don't have all of my uh, students? They don't have any advice, so you have to be very creative, okay? So if something happens, like you have to think on the, on one, two, three possible solutions, okay? And it has to have, I mean, you have to consider those uh, in your lesson plan on your possible problems and solutions. Also, you have to be patient with your students, okay? I mean, I know we work with millennials and centennials now, and you believe that they know uh, everything about technology. They don't, okay? You may believe that uh, your students have a chip, okay? So they're like super connected to internet. They know everything, no. I mean, you have to be very patient, okay? Because I mean, Let's be honest, they know about technology only for entertaining the, the majority of the time. So you have to think about like, how can I explain this? Uh, how can I use the, this technology with my students? So I have to be very patient. Like, how can I explain them? How are we going to use this technology in the class? Or for example, now that we're working on distance, I mean, it happens to us, right? I mean, um, I remember when we went to the quarantine at the beginning, uh, the idea of my principal said, okay, you should uh, use a personal email and contact with your students. I mean, come on, like teenagers, they don't use emails anymore. I mean, for them emails is like something from the past. They prefer like contacting through WhatsApp or Facebook, but they don't use uh, email. So you have to be patient with your students. So you have to explain everything, okay? Okay, smart goals. Uh, you have to think when you're lesson planning and when, you, when you're like working on the rationale of using the technology, you have to think about the smart goals, okay? Like you have to think about using, I mean, the same as a normal class. Like if I'm going to use a, a device, so I have to think on all of these goals. For example, they have to be uh, very specific goals. They have to be measurable. So I, uh, my students uh, know, and I know, and my authorities know that what kind of elements are we going to measure for their grades, right? Uh, accurate, and if it's relevant for the students, I mean, 
For example, if I have teenagers, I won't use any app or platform that it's oriented to uh, elementary students. So I have to think uh, this one uh, as well, right? And obviously you have to have a timeline, okay? Uh, it happens a lot. I mean, you, I don't know if we're gonna see it later, but normally we spend a lot of time with technology at the beginning. I mean, like one activity that you thought it's going to take like five minutes, sometimes it, took, it takes like forever, like 40 minutes. So you have to th think about this one. I mean, if they're gonna create like an infographic or something, or they're gonna create a video or something, a podcast, you have to think about uh, the time, okay? So they have to like consider when they're going to send their, uh, their products. Also, when you're working specifically with technology uh, on the distance right now that we're working with the quarantine, you have to think about this uh, with simple instructions. Like, for example, sometimes as teachers in our lesson plans, we're very complicated. So you have to think about like three, four, like maximum five uh, instructions, uh, especially if you're working with um, people from under like 18 years old. I mean, they're, they kind of like, uh, they struggle with uh, a lot of instructions. So you have to break down all the instructions like, uh, as well, right? Also, you have to be open to students' creativity. I, I already told you that, right? Like you have to think about, uh, perhaps you believe that you have uh, the final product for your students. And sometimes it happens that from one class to another class, there are like uh, classes that they have like a lot of creativity, right? So you have to be open to students' creativity, like let you like, what about if we do this one now? Why don't we do this? So be accept, okay, accept ideas. It's, it's okay. I mean, nothing happens if you change, right? And um, specifically if you're working with, uh, with teenagers and also like you can accept ideas, but remember that you have to accomplish your goals, okay? Also, you have to let your students make their own decisions and promote that, okay? Like sometimes you have like, uh, decisions on the uh, app or the final project. So instead of imposing something, try to let like democratize the, your uh, teaching, okay? So let your students make their own decisions, right? Like sometimes if, what happened if something failed? So you have to also uh, create with them, like working with them, like how can I do this one, right? Because I mean, we have to be honest. Nowadays, I mean, we have jobs that in like 20 years ago, we didn't have. So who knows like what kind of opportunities our students are going to face in 10, 15 or 20 years from now. So you have to like promote those, right? Like how to work with critical thinking and possible problems and solving problems, et cetera, right? Uh, and also I said this one, like set rules and guide them to organize learners work. So you have to set the rules and guide your students, okay? So you have to explain, okay, this is what we're going to do. And also you have to set all the rules. I mean, if you broke the rules, you have a consequence. So uh, my recommendation is you have to let your students to create their consequences. I mean, think about the right their consequences. I mean, if you do, if you, misuse this one of you, if you're working on something else instead of working with my class and with this technology. So they have to face their consequences, okay? So you have to like be honest, okay? And also guide them to organize uh, their work, okay? Because it happens a lot. I mean, they struggle with instructions and so they will struggle with uh, the construction of their learning. So you have to think about how can I guide my students, but not like imposing and not giving them a feeling everything, right? You, should, you have to let your students organize it, like supervising, guiding your students as well. And the last one I, I, uh, I wrote, it was like reflect on your performance and ask your students for feedback, okay? 
So at the end of each class, you have to reflect on your performance, okay? I mean, like what happened? I, I achieved my, my goals. I mean, my students, they were happy, they enjoy, they, they finish the activities, they finish the tasks. So you have to think about these ones, right? Because from class to class, I mean, we all know, right? That we have several differences. And the last one, I, as I said, this one is kind of difficult at the beginning, but as soon as you're like, uh, your students and yourself are like used to uh, accept your students' feedback, I mean, it's going to be really, um, really rich because you're, you're going to gain a lot of uh, knowledge from this one. Like what kind of activities the, uh, my students enjoy? What kind of activities or uh, apps didn't, I mean, didn't achieve anything, right? Did I achieve my goals? Did my students uh, complete everything? So you have to think about this one as well, right? I don't know if we have some ideas with uh, in the audience. Uh, yeah, actually people have some really good ideas that they're sharing. For example, Elizabeth, um, she's saying that we should also keep into consideration the parents' involvement. And I agree with her, I mean, Sometimes yes. some kids don't have access to technology and we have to ask the parents to support us with that. Or for example, sometimes some children um, don't really know how to use technology yes. safely. So parents yes. play a very important part in yeah. this. A high I forgot Timothy, to mention this one, yes. Yeah, Timothy because- One of my, of my, of my closest friends in, in Lima. Oh, okay. Because I, uh, as, it's good that you mentioned that this, one, this uh, Brandon, because it happens nowadays, for example, the most problems that I have now with my, that I'm working on the distance is dealing with parents. So my students, they don't complain, they don't have any problems with technology, but I have problems with my, uh, with the parents. So yes, you have to deal with the parents. And also I think you have to like close the gap with technology also as well, like with your students and with your, with the parents as well. I totally agree. And in here, for example, we have uh, some people saying that uh, parents are, uh, are what uh, we have to keep into consideration. And I agree with you guys because at, at this time, most parents are complaining because we're leaving too many homework or, or, that, or because we are not uh, uh, doing Zoom sessions every day and it's only once a week or because the amount of work is too much. And we have to, to consider that we're not leaving more homework. Uh, we are just doing exactly the same amount of work that we would do uh, in a classroom, but maybe parents were not aware of what was going on in the classroom. So mm -hmm. uh, raising awareness um, with my coordinators and, and school authorities, raising awareness with the parents and having this connection as a community or educational community is really important. And in here, I have some, um, some important tools that I would like to share with you, okay? Uh, as soon as I know how to, how to get back to the, to, the, um, to the PowerPoint. Oh, here am I. Okay, so what resources are there for me? In here we have Edmodo. Edmodo is an online platform where you can actually have uh, different classes and give them access. You can actually upload uh, quizzes, uh, polls, uh, post pictures. It's exactly like Facebook, but for schools. And that's why I love it because it, it has this design that familiars are already familiar with and that they are in love with, but now focused on education. And it's, everything that we're going to share today is, is free, okay? We have Moodle, which is also a platform. However, this one requires a little bit more um, knowledge of how to use it yes i mean the 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 ios i mean the the software is free but i think you have to pay for the the hosting on on moodle on moodle yes uh, ah, yes i mean if, 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 most of the time sorry. it's free for everyone uh but if you want to have like a personalized um, mm -hmm. name for your for your school you do have to pay but uh pay. everyone can access it for free Mm -hmm. uh, Socrative, which is actually used mm -hmm. for uh, exams and questions. So if you want to have an exam with your students uh, while in distance learning, well, Socrative is a good option. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in here, what they're saying is that 
Google Classroom is also a good, um, a good tool. I agree. Now we have it in this section. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, hard for kids to pay attention on e-learning because they have mm -hmm. many distractors at home. I agree. However, if we use the appropriate resources, uh, we can actually help with this to limit it a little bit more. Okay. Now, um, as I was telling you, Duolingo is a, 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 an app that works as a game. You earn points and you earn coins and, and you go through different levels and it can help you to learn any language. And there is actually many people don't know, uh, but there is a Duolingo for schools uh, option, uh, which actually allows you to control and track uh, their students' progress. And it also helps you to actually open which units you want them to focus on specifically. So if you taught, um, I don't know, a vocabulary about clothes at school or in the Zoom session, then you can leave them the unit that is related to clothes on Duolingo and they can like um, review the topic. And what is funny about this one is like, for example, I'm using Duolingo and at the beginning my students were like, Teacher, I mean, I w they were expecting homework instead of uh -huh. playing. And they were like, and the homework, I said, it's Duolingo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really fun because, I mean, it's really funny because, I mean, students don't see this one as a, as a homework. They see it as a, as a game. So it's I really agree. cool. Mm -hmm. And many people were actually saying about the resources that some students don't have access to a phone or to technology or that sometimes they can get distracted. And in here we have two options. For example, we have Kahoot, which is a game, and we have Flickr, which is also a game. So you post or, or you, um, you put your questions a, in a projection and you display them for them to see. And with Kahoot, they have to actually answer on their phone. And what they do is that uh, it gives you immediate feedback on, the, on their answers. Uh, however, for that one, students require a phone. Uh, we can actually share the device or do something. But if you say like, you know what, in my school, they don't allow students to have mobile devices. Well, you have Flickrs. Uh, with Flickrs, instead of using a mobile phone, what you do is that you print a card for a student. And what you do pretty much is that each side um, is equivalent to an answer. And the letters are so tiny that the people around them won't see what answer they are sharing. So they just flip it and flip it until they have the correct answer. The only person who needs a device is you as a teacher. So you scan them with your phone and it immediately gives you the answers uh, on, the, um, on the whiteboard or, or wherever you are projecting the, <laughs> the, um, the Plickers uh, website. Um, we're actually going to share with you uh, a catalog of all the resources that we talk about uh, for you to download for free. Uh, and it is going to be uh, in Excel format so that you can actually add all the resources that you know and that you like, okay? But we have these two options. For those who have access to a lot of technology and for those who are a little bit more limited uh, or restricted. Macmillan Education Sounds, it helps the students to um, practice their pronunciation as well as Euglish. I love Euglish because um, you're looking for the pronunciation of a particular word. And what you do is that you search for it on Euglish and it gives you um, the pronunciation of different uh, examples of that word being used in real context uh, using YouTube videos. YouTube has a lot of resources. For example, Teacher Panda is a resource that you're using right now to learn. Uh, it's a YouTube channel. And you can, use, you can find lots of videos about anything. For example, I teach online. I teach uh, students from Spain. And to me, it is quite difficult to spend an hour explaining something that we have already covered to them because we only have a half an hour class uh, where we cover just the speaking part. So what I do is that I look for a video, a pre-made video. I check the video that it has all the information that I need my student to review, and then I share it to them. So they do it in, in, indefinitely and, and it helps them to, to reinforce what we have covered. WhatsApp. We can do different games on WhatsApp. There are actually several options that you can search for in the internet using WhatsApp in the classroom. And you can actually use, make it for questions, for competitions, games. It allows a lot. And in this case, you will also be able to use it for phone calls if necessary using just the internet. Canva. What is Canva? I love Canva. Uh, if you like graphic design, 
all most of the of the of the things that I posed on, on Teacher Panda were came out of there. They mm -hmm. came out of Canva. So you can actually create uh, very detailed and nice uh, graphics or infographics or charts or um, uh, infographics. Infographics, yes. Um, Tons of material. This thing that has a lot of images. What do you call it? I just forgot. <laughs> Uh, for vocabulary, for example, you can uh -huh, presentation. It, it's got also templates for you mm -hmm. to just like uh, edit a, and make them personalized. Mm -hmm. And it, it is completely free. There are some parts that you do have to pay if you want some specific designs, but mm -hmm. you can actually wing your way around it without the pro parts. Uh, I, I have never paid for Canva, to be honest. Facebook, I display most of my students' work on Facebook as well. Uh, they're mentioning uh, Schoology. I, I agree, it's a good one as well. Games are great for teaching kids and have fun as well. I agree. Kahoot is very fun, okay. It's like flashcards, yes, I agree. You can make flashcards on Canva. And we have more resources for you, actually. Uh, this one, uh, and remember teachers, I mean, uh, these kind of materials that you're seeing, I mean, in a couple of years, you will see that or they change or they disappear, right? I mean, they have to adapt. So the next one that I uh, we brought for you is Minecraft, so Education Edition. It's really cool. I mean, if you have tons of uh, kids, they love to play video games. So this one, I mean, if you're teaching science or uh, history or many other uh, subjects, it's really cool for them. Uh, it has a cost, yes, but well, you can check with your schools as, as well. Uh, we have Padlet, so you can work with collaborative writing. It's really, I mean, it's a really cool uh, platform that, where you can like share with your, with your students. And also uh, Nearpod, it's really new. I think it's like one or two years, uh, this platform. It's kind of like uh, Edmodo and uh, Google Classroom. So it's really cool because you have everything inside. You can create quizzes, activities, videos. I mean, you can do uh, many things, right? And it's free as well. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but you really surprised everyone with Minecraft. So if you could develop that a little bit more, I think they would really appreciate it. About Minecraft? Yeah, they're really interested in that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, for example, uh, I have a class with kids so they love video games, and especially the, because they are, they're all uh, male students. So what I do is, for example, uh, we create stories. So for example, you, first you can learn like vocabulary with students, and you can work, for example, um, tenses with them, like for example, present continuous, simple past, future. So you can like set a class where they have to learn the future, through Minecraft. So uh, for example, you set the rules and you set the goals that they're going to discover. So for example, you are going to do this and then you're going to do that. So suddenly, I mean, the grammar is inside of everything. So it's really cool. I mean, kids love Minecraft. And especially if, you, if you're working with, um, with science also, for example, they go with mining and discovering the land and for example, they learn about animals and they learn about uh, how to create a farm. So it's really, really cool. Minecraft, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you should look for something about Minecraft as well. Um, also, we have Classcraft is the same as well as uh, Nearpod and Edmodo. So you can create activities for your classes. So it's really complete. I mean, you don't have to go anywhere else. So in Classcraft, you can create everything with your students as well. Class Dojo, it surprised me. I mean, like I heard the first time I heard from Class Dojo was like four, five years ago. And Class Dojo was more oriented to classroom management. It was more like about taking the attendance and uh, have a contact with the school authorities and the parents about the, their uh, children's uh, progress. But nowadays, I mean, for example, in this moment that you have to work in the distance, it's really cool. I mean, you can connect with the parents and you don't have to use your uh, personal information. For example, you don't have to provide your personal phone number. 
so you can connect with uh, with their parents. So you can, for example, send the homework and send the instructions and everything. So for example, if their parents, they, I'm sorry, if their children, they have to create like drawings and probably exploring for insects in the garden. So they can take pictures and they can upload them from Class Dojo. It's really cool. I mean, now Class Dojo, it's really, really accomplished. And I use, I, I consider this one like for elementary from like maximum in secondary. But yes, it's really, I mean, it's a really complete now uh, platform. Also, the one that I use is Spreaker Studio. Probably Brandon remember that when I did my Cambridge examination. So in this one, you can create your podcast. So especially if you're working with students and they're kind of shy, so they don't like to appear in a video or something, so they can create radio programs. So for example, you, if you have a final project and at the end of the final project, they have to create a, a, ra a radio station where they project something about vocabulary or whatever. So you can do it. I mean, it's free and it has all the additions with the as a radio program you know like uh an applause or like music or you know um, several sounds that you you could uh, find on Spreaker studio and the the last ones are ed puzzle i really recommend you to go uh with this one because uh this one is really cool i mean how how many times that uh, it happens that we're working with a, a class that we have a, a, a video on YouTube that's really fantastic, but we don't know how to detectize uh, the video. So with Edpuzzle, you can do it. I mean, you have tons of materials that they have already there, but also you can create, I mean, if you want to like explore a video and for example, they're watching a video and suddenly the video stops and the, the, the questions appear on the screen. So it's really cool. I mean, and also you can create the video classes and you can send them to your students. For example, it works with Google Classroom right now. So I really recommend you to go with Edpuzzle. It's a really fantastic app where you can create video uh, classes, right? And the last one, Google Classroom. I mean, like one or two years ago, Google Classroom was kind of like private. So you have to belong to a special school where you can have all the the google classroom and all the g suite uh apps but nowadays google classroom is for free so it's uh i like it because you have all the apps from uh, google so if you you have like for example service you have uh slides you have google documents you have everything so you can set assignments you can send them videos, you can uh, receive homework uh, through Google Classroom. So those are the ones that I really recommend you nowadays that you were work, working with this quarantine. Okay, and some people are saying that um, it is not really technology, but they play with Jeopardy. Actually, mm -hmm. um, you can use a Jeopardy template downloaded from the internet, just Google, uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation, PowerPoint Jeopardy template for free. You download whichever you like, and then you edit it, you put the information in there, and you can actually play Jeopardy with the students using that PowerPoint presentation. Uh, in my case, I am teaching um, a teacher training course, a TKT preparation course to some people in Sonora. And what I do is that if I have to give them a task where they have to answer questions, Either I use Socrative or I do it as a game with, um, with uh, Kahoot, for example. Um, in Socrative, there is this part that is called like a space race. So the person who's faster at answering and getting the, the highest score uh, is a winner, for so to speak. So it can be kind of like a competition. And I also use the, the PowerPoint presentation of a, of a Jeopardy game. So the idea is that these resources, you can actually use them to replace some of the activities that we already know how to do, but to make them just more fun or more engaging. Uh, but it's exactly the same, just in a different presentation. So the idea that you actually take from what works for you, and if it doesn't work, experiment with other, other resources that there are available to you. Okay, so some websites that I think that are really good to highlight. Um, this one I love is called retheory.org. 
Uh, it is not a sponsor. Anything here, nothing here is a sponsor, uh, but it's a website that I really love. Uh, why? Because it gives you, well, first uh, you create a, an account as a teacher. And once you have the account, you actually can create your students' accounts or you can actually make your students join your class. And it is completely free uh, and students have to do all the work. You only receive the reports. So the students do a, 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 a test that is going to give them their level and is going to give them readings and questions. The idea is for them to develop these reading skills of skimming, scanning, reading for detailed information. And every time they improve, the questions and the texts are going to become more and more and more and more difficult. And for example, if you see on the right, we have a report of students. These are obviously fake students. And uh, the little line is the average of the class. The little like square or rhomboid figure that you have in there is the level that they had when they took the, the test. And um, it is also going to tell you whether they improved or whether they are performing poorly. It is also going to give you reports like this one that you can actually show your coordinator or authorities or even parents. So I really like it. Um, yeah, this is for kids that are not poor. I agree. Um, unfortunately, uh, not many students have access to technology and not many students have access to all these kind of resources. And it is our job as teachers to identify how can we actually minimize the inequity gap, right? And how can I actually make them uh, be able to, to have access to this? Um, and what I've noticed is that many teachers actually are able to do it through talking to the parents, talking to the schools. Um, some schools actually start allowing um, their students to go there to do homework. Um, so it is important to bear in mind these in the part of problems and solutions. And you have, if I have some students who actually have access to it uh, in my class, because right now we're focusing a little bit more on, on classwork, um, we can actually use them with them as well. Now, uh, what I like about re-theory is that you can actually have reports of all the students, but also individual students for you to actually give um, authorities. Write and Improve, this is a website designed and developed by Cambridge, and it's got activities for all levels. And it actually has activities for um, different purposes. So the idea is that you, the students just choose the level that they want, and they, you can either assign the task yourself, uh, you tell them like, okay, you're going to go to uh, Write and Improve Beginner, for example, and you're going to complete the postcard um, task. And it tells you, uh, or it tells them how many words they have to write and, and the information that it has to include. They write the, their answers, as you can see on the lower right side. And it gives them feedback. As soon as they send check, it gives them feedback on what is correct, what is not correct, what may be the possible mistake. It also gives them the level A1, A2, B1, B2. And the idea is that you can actually uh, ask them to do the task again once they receive the feedback and their level should improve. That's why it's called write and improve. Feedback is really accurate. I like it a lot. And it also has practice for a specific test like IELTS or, or FCE. Uh, remember that this is a specific for Cambridge. But I like it because it's got a lot of opportunities for you to actually um, give them more practice on developing these, their writing skills at home. And they just take a screenshot of their, of their work and they can give it to you uh, or send it to you, whatever you prefer. And it's really useful because it maximizes, maximizes class time. Unite for Literacy, this is a project that is really dear to me. I, I participated with them, I collaborated with them. Um, Unite for Literacy is a company that is trying to allow students to have access to books. And the idea, is that it is completely free. I mean, if you want to have access to it, you can actually just click on the link of Unite for Literacy and have access to hundreds of books. And what I like is that it also has narrations in different languages, and you can also have uh, books in different languages as well. Uh, I helped them with their uh, library for Mexico specifically, uh, where they created hundreds of books in Spanish, 
but you can also change uh, to other languages, as I'm telling you. You can use them in class. It is focused for emerging readers. So uh, those of you who work with kids or those of you who have kids even, you can actually find it really interesting, useful. It fosters lots of values. And I actually like that it is completely free for everyone to have access to it. So the next one is going to make your life so much easier. Um, if you are the person in charge of designing exams <laughs> and you spend most of your day grading, you just go to uh, sipgrade.com and you download some templates and you can design half of the exam in multiple choice, for example. And you just edit the, the little cards in here on the website. So let's imagine that half of the exam is done with the Sipgrade uh, template and the rest is open questions or other kinds of tasks. What I have to do is to just scan the answers and I have the names of the students and I also have um, how many answers were correct and how many were incorrect. So I can just like mark the incorrect ones and move on. Um, what I like about this one is that it makes your life much faster and easier. <laughs> I hate grading and this reduces my, my work by half because now I only focus on the questions that are open or the, the questions that require a little bit more development or just grading the writing or, or, or other things instead of just focusing on multiple choice questions because I can just scan them, okay? And we also have a Speaky. Speaky is an app. This one is more recommended for adults. I wouldn't suggest it that much for kids unless you use them with kids who are supervised by an adult. And it is for language swaps or language tab tandem exercises. So you find a native speaker of the language that you're interested in learning. And the idea is that you are going to talk or he or she is going to talk in, in, in for example, in this case, I think it's Portuguese. <laughs> and you're going to talk to them in English because they want to practice English and you want to practice their language. So for example, if you're a Spanish teacher, um, sorry, an English teacher, um, you can actually tell your university students or children with <laughs> supervision um, to find a native speaker of the language who speaks English. And they speak to, in Spanish to them and they speak in English to them and they exchange. And you can actually give feedback like, okay, you know what? It is not said like this or it is not written like this. You have to do it that way. And that's why I like it because it, it, it gives you the, um, it allows you to provide feedback so you can actually improve and have some kind of input. Okay, so in here, um, they are talking about apps for speaking. This one is useful for speaking. Uh, I work with students that live in poverty. That's why I bring my own resources to my classroom. Yes, and we're actually going to talk about how to tackle those, those, those problems. Like, okay, you know what? I don't have internet or I don't have, or, or my students don't have a phone. What can I do? And we can actually talk about some problems and solutions. And as I mentioned before in, in one of the first um, flashcards, um, before we actually implement technology, we have to think, is it really going to help? Um, is it really necessary? And sometimes you don't really have to use technology. It is going to help, yes. It is going to make it more engaging, yes. But it is, at the end of the day, it's an aid, all right? Uh, and as all the other resources that we have in the classroom, is not essential. The only thing that is essential is knowledge and students. <laughs> okay, Abraham, uh, you're going to share some ideas in here, right? Yes, uh, we're going to work about uh, challenges that we have or we face with uh, when we're using technology, as some of you mentioned through the chat. So yes, like we mentioned before, it's time consuming, but uh, only like at the beginning. I mean, as long as you're like your students used to use technology and also as well as you uh, as a teacher, you're like used to work with that technology like video conferences or any app. I mean, it's going to take less and less time and also malfunctions, okay? Sometimes we have uh, no internet. Sometimes uh, we have to think about if we're going to use an app, maybe you have an iPhone and maybe uh, the app doesn't work well with Android version. So you have to think about those uh, important elements, right? 
also limited resources, okay? What happens if my students, they don't have uh, personal devices like uh, smartphones or, or tablets? So you have to think about how can I organize my group in order to like let all my students work with the, or have the chance to have uh, the opportunity. Uh, also, it's difficult to control sometimes, especially if you have like a large group, okay? So it could be very exhausted. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying like technology is going to solve everything, but um, yes, it, ha it helps you, but it sometimes it's difficult to control. So we have to think about technology. I mean, it's not the solution of everything, right? But it's a really good tool. Uh, safety and privacy, okay? You have to think about the safety of your students, especially if you're working with a certain app, okay? For example, there is an app that it's called Wallami. Uh, it's a really cool app where you can uh, work with augmented reality. So you're, I don't know if you remember this, uh, um, this game, it, it was called, um, uh, I don't know, it was in Dragon Ball. What is the other one? Uh, Minecraft? Um, no, no, no. Where is Pikachu and I forgot. Pokemon Go? Pokemon Go, yes. I mean, it's kind of like Pokemon Go. So you set like certain um, questions on the, like you take a picture and it works with the GPS. So no one can see it. The, the only ones who can see it is through the same app. So it's a really cool application. But the only problem is that it's kind of like a social network. So you may find something that is going to be tricky. So this is when I said you have to think about the safety of your students and also the privacy. I mean, I have seen so many teachers that they upload pictures of their students and their work. So you have to take that in mind. I mean, don't, especially if you're working with uh, minors, I mean, Please don't. I, I mean, would like to jump into this part. Um, yes. I think that safety and privacy is one of the most important aspects to consider uh, when talking about technology. Mm -hmm. I do post a lot of my work uh, on Facebook, for example, uh, and I post the pictures of my students. But first of all, they allow me, they give me permission. And second of all, they are all adults right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since I haven't taught kids. Uh, and I always tell them before you post a picture with your students, no matter if they are, if the kids agree, uh, if a parent doesn't agree with that, please avoid it. Second of all, um, it is in some countries and in some cities, you have to, to be careful because it is also illegal. Yes. So many people have faced several problems because of this uh, and you can actually be sued. So when we are talking about technology, we have to be careful of, okay, this app, for example, is picky. They're going to talk to a complete stranger. I cannot use it with a kid. I, can, I have to use it with someone that is actually mature enough. Uh, that's why I'm suggesting it more for adults or university students, but not for a kid. Um, Facebook, uh, it's got a lot of apps that may not be appropriate for everyone. Um, so we're actually going to talk about this as well when Abraham tells us about uh, evaluating resources. I know that we're going a little bit beyond the time. I, I'm sorry for that, uh, but it's because we really wanted to share as many resources as we could. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I'm telling you, we're going to share as well um, a list of all of these for you to download for free. Okay? Yes, because some of them are uh, posting or commenting that, uh, uh, about the resources, so don't worry, okay? So at the end, uh, we're, we're gonna let you know how can you have access. Okay, and now students engagement, okay? You have to think about uh, if the app is appropriate with the student. I mean, if it's relevant, okay? Sometimes you believe this app is really cool. I mean, they would love uh, to work with this and they hate it. So take, the, take this one in mind, like sometimes it happens, I mean, that students, they, they don't feel like engaged with that. So also dealing with technology, okay? So you have to take a class where you have to like work with your students, okay? Like uh, prepare for the class and then they can explore the app. How can I work with that? For example, if now if you're working with video conferences, you have to take a, a, just a lesson in order to like all your students know where's the chat, how can they, put mute on their microphone or how can they like 
connect and disconnect from the video conference and sorry Abraham, uh, yes. your microphone is like scratching with your tie <laughs> oh sorry thank you so also like you said parents involvement i mean uh it happens like uh, i remember like three years ago i gave a course about technology in the classroom and one of my <clears throat> one of my uh, the teachers uh he told me that their parents didn't like technology at all so i was like kind of like confused like why i mean i i couldn't understand that so when i saw that the the approach for, for the teacher in, to work with the parents it was kind of like um uh, disruptive i mean she wasn't like explaining the advantages or all the benefits that their kids are going to have so my recommendation is like you have to work with the parents i mean you have to convince them and you have to explain them the rationale of your using of technology and so, also um, yes uh some people are talking about uh schools with limited resources um in here i like uh, i wanted to jump in sorry my my video was off i didn't realize don't worry <laughs> uh in here i had to jump in because um we have to consider some 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 parts of this Unless you work uh, at a very economically disadvantaged school where students don't have access to anything, uh, which has been rare, and trust me that I have even taught uh, or observed teachers teaching at a, um, at a farm. Uh, I've been everywhere. <laughs> and even in those cases, most students had access to at least one phone, uh, if not in class, at home. So you can, that's why we're talking about uh, parents' involvement and authorization from school authorities, because you are actually trying to involve the entire learning community <laughs> to foster uh, education and to foster learning. And in here, uh, when you actually justify why you're doing something to the parents and how it's going to benefit the students and how it's going to benefit uh, the school and their learning process, most of the times uh, they, they, they kind of like change their minds about how they perceive technology, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, for most of these apps, you need just one phone. Uh, for example, I, I work for the American consulate in this program that was uh, aimed to economically disadvantage uh, students with the access micro scholarship program. The idea is to prevent them from joining uh, a gang or to prevent them from joining the um, organized crime. And they come from a very economically disadvantaged sector, but all of them had access to a phone. And if they didn't, most of the time they would spend the, some money they had on using Facebook at a, at a cafe. So why not like encouraging them to use that time for learning in a fun way, okay? Mm -hmm. There are many things that we can do. Uh, some uh, libraries have actually free access to internet and also to computers. Um, that's why we need to be aware and conscious about what we can do to in our lesson plan, all right? Mm -hmm. Learning, learner training here is, uh, as Abraham mentioned, is important. If you don't teach the students to use it or to do something, they will not be able to do it. One thing is what we teach regarding language and another one is learner training how we want them to behave, uh, how we want them to react, what we want them to do, things like that. Mm. And as he mentions, expect the unexpectable, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what for example, you, that you have to think about all the possible things that it could happen, right, in the class. Like, for example, you had a four students uh, classroom, so uh, you agree with that all of them are going to bring their own device. And at the end, they, you have like only like 12, 13 mobile devices. So like maybe you can think about, okay, if they don't bring their cell phone, probably I can arrange the, the class in a different way, right? Also the access to technology. What happens if they have like a really old cell phone? So you have to think about this one. That's why you have to like, you have to have a learner training process. And uh, technology is important, but it's not everything. Okay, like we all know that we, for example, I love technology. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I mean I, I understand that it's not everything. I mean, like uh, Brandon says at the beginning, technology is not is not going to replace us, and we have to think. Let me explain this. 
I mean, some teachers, I, I have heard this, this saying that, uh, that we are so obsessed with technology, right? And they see technology as something coming from Mars or from another planet. I mean, no, I mean, technology, it's, it's human. I mean, we humans, I mean, we create technology. So, and technology is created for, for us. So we have to take advantages of all of these things about technology and how can we implement it into our classrooms? For example, uh, you have seen, or for example, if, if in the audience were like many English teachers, I mean, we can see that many theories comes from the time of World War. And now teachers, we use those uh, methodologies in our classes. So it's the same with technology, right? And the last one, netiquette rules. I mean, we have to think about the way we, 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 we behave while, while, while we are using technology, sorry. So we have to explain like, what are the netiquette rules? I mean, the same as the etiquette rules when we are eating, the same as when we're using mobile devices or any technology. Okay. And we have we're going to go a little bit fast on these ones faster, because yes. we know that we're already like half an hour past, well, no, 20 minutes. Oh, like 20. So let me explain it like little, really fast. You can see this video later on, so it's not any problem. So remember, when you're like working with a resource ah. evaluation, app, so Sorry. <laughs> remember, try the app or the platform platform before, okay? Always like try them like one, two, three, I mean, four times if it's necessary, okay? Especially if it's a really specific class that you want to show the parents or your school that your kids can manage technology, okay? Uh, I suggest, suggest you to watch video tutorials so in YouTube, you will find tons of them, okay? So watch them. I mean, they're really helpful, okay? Also, my recommendation, read the comments from the tutorials, okay? Sometimes in the tutorials, you can see comments about their problems while using those apps or platforms. So uh, please read them. <laughs> Google for information, okay? I mean, everything is on the internet. I mean, I, I, I can understand, for example, nowadays that I have seeing teachers asking, for example, I'm um, sorry, what is the telephone, uh, what is the phone number of the office uh, for, I don't know, like for a service? I mean, come on, everything is on Google. I mean, why, okay? Uh, check also well-known references, okay? If that app or that platform, it's back from another authority, okay? For example, Google Classroom, I mean, we know that Google, I mean, the company is it's behind this one, okay? Check ranking on the comments at the App Store or Play Store. I mean, when you're going to download the app, okay, you can see the comments also as well. So try to read them, okay? Specifically, I mean, be specific on the negative uh, comments. So you can see the possible problems or the maybe uh, some tricks that uh, those apps could have, okay? Set a moment to test the app for the platform with your students to show them how, to, how it works, okay? like explain everything, like like you have to be very, very uh, uh, explicit on explaining everything on the app. Well. Okay, guys. Well, we have come to an end. Thank you everyone for joining us. You have some questions, so I will try to answer them. Many people are asking about the, um, the digital badge. Uh, you have to go to the Teacher Panda Facebook page and in there, what we're going to do is that we're going to share the links to a little test, okay? Everything is on the, on the Teacher Panda Facebook page, okay? Some sponsors may have also, well, not sponsored, but some of the institutions that work with us um, have also shared it uh, to their Facebook pages. So in there, we will post the link to the little test that you have to answer on e uh, for each talk. And if you pass the test, you will receive a digital badge in about 20 days, okay? Um, but everything is in there, all the information is in there. Uh, for example, if you want to have access to the next links, because some people are asking about it, you can go to the, um, to the event section on Teacher Panda, click on the, on the event that you're interested in, and then click on discussion. And in there, all the information on how to get the digital badge, how to get the links and everything will be posted. Um, so just check for, for Teacher Panda on Facebook, like us, subscribe to this video, 
And again, thank you to all of, of our sponsors. Thank you for enseña, uh, to Enseña por México, Canada Michoacán, Unite for Literacy, um, English for Life, uh, Smart Training Mexico, which is a company that uh, has just started and, and I love it already. Uh, they have supported me a lot. And Codice, which is a, a, an organization that helps um, a sector that is uh, in disadvantage, okay? So thank you very much uh, to everyone for attending. And if you have any question, uh, you can actually uh, write to me on the Teacher Panda Facebook page and I will gladly um, uh, answer. The link to download the digital resources website, uh, sorry, uh, resource, well, the file, sorry, is going to be on Teacher Panda as well, so don't miss it out. Thank you guys, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Abraham, for everything too. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, Brendan. And thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.